Well, good morning, church. It's an honor to be here sharing with you this morning our very first message of our Christmas series. And I love Christmas. I can be a bit intense about Christmas sometimes. In fact, I was actually told that last week that I'm not allowed to even set up the Christmas decorations for our online service because I'm the Christmas guy. And my response was, well, let's just do plain trees. I mean, that will be fine as long as every single branch is just placed in the right spot which I guess shows why I wasn't invited to help with the Christmas decorations. But anyway, we're so happy to be here with you this morning, wherever you're watching from. And it's an honor to share with you at Christmas time. Christmas is such an exciting season, but it looks so different for us, for all of us this year. In fact, when writing to us about our Christmas series, Pastor Paul mentioned that he put up his Christmas lights early this year because he just needed that extra boost of joy and hope in his house. And actually, I read an article in the news that many, many people are doing that this year. People are even adding Christmas lights into their Zoom calls to just get that extra boost of hope in a year that's been really, really hard for many of us. You know, we're actually in a season of hope, and Christmas lights remind us of that. I was reading an article this week that said that light is actually the most universal symbol for hope. You see it in movies, you see it in books. You see it in poetry. Light often symbolizes hope. I mean, you see it all the time in one of my favorite movies, Lord of the Rings, all the time. You know, Gandalf is out there just wielding, shining light everywhere. You see it everywhere in stories of people lost in the woods and suddenly they see light through a window of a cabin. And so they have hope and they walk towards the light. Light equals hope. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about a light finally coming. And we celebrate that light at Christmas time. So let's dive into scripture. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 4. It's a fascinating scripture that is actually a repeat of a prophecy found in Isaiah chapter 9. So let's read it together. It says, This fulfilled what was said through the prophet Isaiah. In the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, beside the sea, Beyond the Jordan River in in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. This passage reminds me that Jesus has come, and because he has come at Christmas time, there is hope. And there's still hope for you and me today. When describing light in this passage, the passage uses what's called present or a present perfect tense. In verse 16, it says, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. It says, a light has shined. And the present perfect tense is actually used for situations that have happened in the past, but are still continuing to happen today. Or sometimes used for situations that happened in the past and then have happened an unknown number of times since then. So you might use... The present perfect tense for saying something like, my parents have lived in Kitsilano since 1984. It means they lived there in 1984 and they still live there today. So when scripture says here that people have seen a great light, what it's actually saying is that people are still seeing a great light. What scripture is saying here is that when the light shined then, it is still shining now. It's a, this hope that Jesus brought to earth at Christmas time is still available to us today. That we celebrate a Christmas that happened so long ago, but all of the ramifications are happening repeatedly and repeatedly, even for us today. And this is what we need this year, maybe more than any other year, is hope. So I want to talk to you this morning about four places or four situations that are mentioned in this passage where light has shined, where hope has come. So let's dive into those four situations this morning. They're mentioned in this passage, and it talks about the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. It talks about to those who live in darkness and to those who live in the land where death has cast its shadow. So let's dive in first to the land of Zebulun. Now, the land of Zebulun was actually named after one of Jacob's descendants who settled in this area of Galilee. And Zebulun means two different things. It means dwelling or it means a gift. So it has this connotation of this very comfortable place to live. 
that it's, um, you're just dwelling, you're hanging out, you've got everything that you need. And even for people who are living in this land of being comfortable, a light has come. So even if you're in that kind of situation where maybe COVID has been very inconvenient for you or all of the things that have happened this year have been inconvenient, but really your life is still pretty comfortable, let me tell you that a light has come. A hope has come even for you. And for those of us who this year has been really, really hard, but we're trying our best to count our blessings and to look on the bright side and just stay positive, we're trying our best to live in the land of Zebulun where everything is comfortable. Even for you, a light has come. Even for you, hope is here. And I find it so fascinating that even in this kind of place where everyone is trying their best to look on the bright side, the bright side still pales in comparison to the true light that comes with Jesus. It is nothing compared to the light that Jesus brings, to the hope that he brings to our lives. So friends, remember, no matter how comfortable we try to get, no matter how positive we try to stay, no matter how many times we remind ourselves, just look on the bright side, just look on the bright side, the bright side isn't going to be bright enough. You need Jesus, and only in him is true light and true hope found. So even to you, who live in Zebulun, a light has come. The next part that we see in this passage, very, very close to the land of Zebulun. Actually, if you look in a map of this region at this time, you would see that the land of Nephtali is right next door to the land of Zebulun, which is fascinating to me. It reminds me that right next door to this place where we feel so comfortable is this other place called Nephtali, which means the land of wrestling. And they're so closely related. It just takes a minute to get from this place of being very comfortable to this place of wrestling. Nephtali was also named after one of Jacob's descendants. And like I said, it means in my wrestling. Nephtali is a place where we find ourselves wrestling through things that seem very uncertain. You might find yourself wondering about things, wondering how you're going to make ends meet. You might wonder what you're going to do tomorrow, or how long your job is going to last, or you might find yourself wrestling with your kids, or wrestling with your spouse, or wrestling with what is Christmas really going to look like for my family this year. Nephtali is this land of wrestling. Is this you? Is this where you're finding yourself this morning, in a land of wrestling? I'm sure it's probably where many of us are finding ourselves in this season. But even for those of us in the land of Nephtali, in the land of wrestling, even for us, hope has come. Then let's move into the first half of verse 16. It says, To the people who have sat in darkness, they have seen a great light. Now this idea of darkness actually has more of a spiritual connotation. It's less about our circumstances and what we're going through and more about like our own spiritual darkness, or our own spiritual blindedness. But the Bible reminds us that even to those of us who are spiritually blind, even to those of us who are living in darkness without hope, without rescue, even for us in that situation, hope has come. So if you're watching this morning and you feel like you're in darkness, if you're feeling like there is no hope, you have no rescue, let me tell you that you do. His name is Jesus and he came at Christmas time so that you can have hope. And I know that especially this year, we find ourselves in many situations where it feels like we just can't do it on our own or we are not good enough or we don't have enough. And I just want to remind you this morning, you were never even designed to do this by yourself. We were never designed to be good enough. We were never designed to have enough. But in Jesus, in the true light, in true hope, we have what we need. And hope has come. It's really simple. All you have to do is believe that Jesus came to earth and die in your place so that you might have a more full and abundant life with him. I mean, Jesus paints this beautiful picture in scripture where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens it, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And it's this beautiful invitation that Jesus is knocking on the doors of our lives. 
or the doors of our hearts and waiting for us to open them that he might come in and be in relationship with us. Do you feel that sort of prompting on your own heart this morning as you're listening? If you do, I want to pray with you this morning to invite Jesus to be a part of your life. So if you're listening and you're feeling that prompting, why don't you pray with me wherever, at, wherever you're at? You can uh, echo it in your heart, or if you want, pray out loud along with me. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you came to earth so that we might have abundant life. Jesus, forgive me for the moments where I try to go at it alone. Forgive me for the moments where I have fallen short of what you have set out for me, where I've fallen short of your standard for my life. That is sin, God. And I'm sorry for the ways that I have sinned against you. And friends who are watching at home, just take a minute and maybe reflect here on ways that you um, might have sinned, the ways that you might have feeling like you've fallen short, and take a minute to um, ask forgiveness from Jesus. And so God, we thank you that you sent your one and only son to bring us hope for this life, to bring us hope for today. And we receive that today. We receive that this morning. And we commit to the best that we can walking with you each day from this moment on. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, in the second half of verse 16, it actually talks about even another situation where hope has come. And this situation probably applies to a lot of us this morning as well. In the second half of verse 16, it says, For those who lived in the land where death has cast its shadow, a light has shined. We see this phrase very famously in another part of scripture in Psalm chapter 23, where it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I mean, don't we all feel kind of like that, that we are in death's shadow? Whether maybe it's not physical death. Some of us have experienced death very close to us. But maybe you feel more like you're experiencing emotional death or exhaustion or mental or even spiritual in this season. This is talking to people who are living in the land where death has cast its shadow. And the joyful thing about Christmas, the joyful thing about Jesus shining his light on earth is that even in those situations, hope has come. The idea of the shadow of death recognizes that we're not in true darkness. We are simply just walking through a shadow. So if you find yourself in this kind of situation this morning, remember to keep walking. Though it might feel very challenging, it might feel very dark where you are, it is only a shadow. And even to those of you who live in the land where death has cast its shadow, even for you, hope has come. And this all begs this question is like, but how do I have hope? How do I maintain hope? This has been such a challenging year. How do I maintain hope? How do I grow hope in my life? Well, friends, it's uh, good news and hard news, but hope is kind of like, it's like planting a seed in the fall. Or if you garden, maybe you're planting bulbs in the fall and you plant them and you wait all winter long in hopes that something in the spring will grow. That's a little bit like what hope is, that it starts small and oftentimes hope implies waiting. Oftentimes, it implies working hard. But we have hope. We celebrate hope at Christmas. In some translations of this uh, passage that we just read in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 16, it actually says, a light has dawned. And I love that translation because hope is like the dawn, where you see it on the horizon and it starts as just a little glimmer on the horizon. And then slowly, over time, light begins to grow and fill the whole area around it. That's what hope is like. So this morning, I want to dive into another passage and we'll look at three ways that we might maintain or grow hope in our own lives. So let's look at the book of Hebrews. We're going to dive into chapter 6 verses 11 and 12. So let's read together. 
And the author of Hebrews at this point is talking to a group of people who've had an incredible spiritual experience of salvation, and they are working hard to share their faith through love with other people. But the author is reminding them not to lose heart because the going gets tough or the work seems long. The author is reminding them to have hope in this passage. So it's very similar to us where we might start to feel tired in our hope. But he says these things in verse 11 and 12. It says, We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This verse mentions three ways that we might build and maintain hope in our lives, that we would orient, we would initiate, and we would imitate. The first one is right there in verse 11 where it says, and we desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. It mentions full assurance. This is a confident hope. We have to remember that hope in Christ is not like our earthly or worldly hope. I mean, we misuse the word hope all the time. You might have even said something like it today. Um, oh, I, I hope that the coffee's ready when I get downstairs. Or uh, last night, oh, I really hope we have tacos for dinner. Or I hope there isn't too much traffic on my way to work. Or I hope that my spouse is in a good mood when they get home. But all of these kinds of hope are actually based on uncertainty. We're saying it because we're not sure that thing is actually going to happen. And that is not biblical hope. Biblical hope is based on a full confidence. In this passage, it says a full assurance. Biblical hope remembers that the outcome relies on whom we hope in, not on the thing that we hope for. Biblical hope remembers that the answers to our prayers rely on the person we pray to, not the person asking the prayers. This kind of sure and confident hope is what we celebrate right now at Christmas time. It's, the, it's what we need today, and it is available to us. It's a hope that finds rest in God's incomparable power, in his unwavering faithfulness, and his unending love for both you and for me. So step one in building and maintaining hope is that we orient ourselves towards God's faithfulness that we stay constantly oriented, looking at God for all that we need, not because that's what we need, but because of his faithfulness, that he is faithful no matter what, that we would orient ourselves to face him. The step two that's mentioned in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter six, it says, so that you might not be sluggish. This is imploring us that once we have this full assurance of hope, that we might do something about it. So don't fall into this idea that hope is a passive activity, that you just hope for something and you wait at home until it happens. But true, confident hope means that we begin to work towards the thing that we hope for. It's not enough to just simply hope for a better job or hope for a better marriage or a better relationship with your kids. But we need to actually take strategic steps toward the goal. And yes, of course, we always rely on God to show up and to show off in ways that we never could do on our own, but we too have to do our part. It's like a farmer praying for rain and then never going out into the field to actually work the ground. His harvest still won't happen. It's the same for us, that we have to do the work. We can hope in God, but we have to step out in faith and begin to do something with it. We can pray for rain, but we need to work the ground. So what steps are you taking this morning towards the hope or the desire or the dream that God has put in your life? And for some of us, it's really simple. It might just be to get through the Christmas season or uh, in a way that's loving and caring to your family. It might be a huge dream of even a ministry that God has put in your, in your mind and in your heart. What are you hoping for? And what steps are you taking once you have this full assurance towards that goal? And the third way that we might maintain hope is to imitate. So in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, it says that you might not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. We have this tremendous capacity within the body of believers to stir up hope within one another. 
that as we find people around us who have actually walked out the walk that is in front of us, we would find hope. And this passage implores us to actually be imitators of those people. So once you find someone who's walked the walk and they've done it in a way that was honoring to God, be imitators of that. Find out what they did. Ask them. Meet them. Find mentors in your life that you can actually imitate their actions. It's going to show you that you are not alone. It's going to show you that the mountain that seems like it's standing in your way is actually movable. It's going to show you that the obstacles that stand in your way are surmountable. And it's going to show you that hope is still here, even today. So friends, this Christmas season, throughout this entire series, know that hope has come. A light has shined, and it's still shining. It's still available for you and for me, even today. So grab a hold of it. Maintain it by orienting yourself towards God, initiating the next steps, and imitating those who have come before you and who have obtained the prize. There is hope. 